Okay, folks, I know that I usually try to keep it pretty positive around here, but a few days ago, I found the wildest, most terrible thing, and I needed to share it with you. So buckle in, because this is gonna be a trip. Before I jump straight into things, I do want to give a quick content warning. I'm going to be briefly talking about some pretty heavy stuff like domestic abuse and human trafficking and pickup artistry, so feel free to skip this one if you need to, but for the rest of us, let's get into this. I guarantee you don't walk around your house with a sword. This man is Emery Andrew Tate III, and he is well known for two things, being a champion kickboxer and being a pickup artist super creep. If you've heard of him, it's probably because he's been talked about by most, if not all, of the big commentary channels, because everything he does is just terrible. Like, he's a pickup artist, which is shitty on its own, but also, when you look him up, you get lots of articles with headlines like these, where he's referred to as the king of toxic masculinity. And you can also read about how he got kicked off of Big Brother for hitting one of the women, like it's on video and everything, though he says that it was consensual, so use your judgment on that one. One of the worst things, which is only alleged, but one of the worst things is how he got in trouble with the Romanian authorities. So he lives in Romania because according to him, they have lax sexual assault law. So why did he get in trouble, you ask? Well, for allegedly human trafficking. It's alleged that he had women held in his house against their will. And I think that some of those charges have actually been dropped. And again, this is all alleged, but... Now, it's not speculation that he also pressures his partners into doing sex work, which he then takes 75% of the profits from. Like, he literally brags about that on his channel. So there's lots of reasons that this guy is just a bad dude. But I found him through this TikTok. Reading books is a very cheap way to, I guess, entertain. I wouldn't call it entertainment because my brain is far too advanced. I'm too smart to read. I need to sit there and go, smart people read. No, I need action. I need constant chaos in my life to feel content. I need to be driving a supercar and fighting, a bunch of hoes and champagne and going crazy. I can't just sit there. Oh, oh, and the pirate on the boat. Like, just for, for people with slow brain. And I just, it's just, it's so beautiful, you know, to find someone whose outlook on life is just so wildly different from yours. It really, it, it just brings everything else into focus, you know? Anyway, I'm not here to make fun of this specific video. I mean, I could, but I don't know that I need to. Like, it's shitty and also kind of silly and honestly probably says more about him and his brain than about books generally. Like, I don't want to armchair diagnose him or anyone for that matter, but if you think that your brain moves too quickly to read books, it might be worth considering whether you have a learning disability or possibly even dyslexia. But anyway, so I saw this video and it's wild. And so I needed to learn more about this guy. I mean, if this video is this bad, then what is his other content like? Well, I checked out his YouTube channel and he makes videos about how like we're living in the matrix and in order to get out, you have to go to his cool boy summer camp that costs $5,000. And what are you getting when you go to the summer camp? Well, let's go to his website and check it out. <laughs> okay, so we have Hugh, Hugh too. Uh, this is some kind of university where he teaches you how to like hustle. Uh, and then we have the War Room, which is the $5,000 boys club where you get to, I don't know, I guess like hang out with bald muscular men and smoke cigars and do yoga, which honestly, ideal vacation. <laughs> And then we have Tales of Wudon. What is that? I'm too smart to me. Okay, so let me get this straight. Someone who is unequivocally anti-book has written a book. I needed to read it. So I put in my email and signed up to get it and I did not receive an email back. I didn't get anything. Like, dude, I gave you my email. Give me my ebook. That is how this transaction works. 
Well, while I wait to get my email, let's take a look at this preview that we get on his website. In a previous life, I lived 5,000 human years atop Wudon Mountain. I remember every lived second. Okay, so this is gonna be some sort of like fiction story about a character learning martial arts atop a secluded mountaintop monastery. I can get behind that. Life is competition. Competition is violence. The largest, strongest, most beautiful tree violently crushed the surrounding saplings in the quest for resources. Andrew? Do you know how trees work? Atop Wudon, I told Priest Master Yan Hui how at peace I felt amongst the trees. I could feel life all around me. Sitting at the foot of the largest tree, I asked him, When life is so beautiful, why do we fight? His reply was simple. Do you think the largest tree you sit beneath grew so tall amongst many if it did not fight? Okay, confirmed. Andrew Tate does not know how trees work. Cool. <laughs> you are meant to struggle. You are here to suffer. If you do neither of these things, you are either dead or invisible. You're a nobody. And every female will prove to you, you may as well not exist. Evolution requires pain. We are born valueless, and you either build yourself into a king, or you fail. Okay, so I think that this probably gives us the best idea of what to expect in the stories. Lots of violence, lots of suffering, lots of proving yourself to females, and our protagonist building himself into a king. I don't think that's how monarchies work, but sure, whatever, it's fine, sounds great. So this is all that I got, and then when I checked my email a few hours later, I did have an email from Andrew Tate. Except the email was just the text of the prologue that he has on his website. Turns out that when you put in your email to get this ebook, what you're really doing is subscribing to daily emails where every day he sends you one of the stories. But this wasn't good enough for me. I needed this book and I needed the whole thing, and I couldn't wait weeks and weeks for all of the stories to filter down into my inbox. I didn't even know how many there would be. So I did a little Googling. I mean, it had to be somewhere online, right? <laughs> well, I found the artist who did the work that's on Tate's website, and he had put up some of the pages online, but there were only five stories on this artist's portfolio, and I wanted to see if there were more. So I did some more Googling, and found out that he actually shares all of the stories in their entirety on the official Tales of Wudon Twitter account. He just breaks each story into tweet-sized snippets and puts them in threads. So I spent like three hours combing through every thread on his profile to find the beginning of each story, and then I put those into a thread on Roller, and then spent another hour like copying and pasting them into another document and reformatting them to be in short story format. And then I actually read them. And whoo boy. <laughs> like, the writing quality is fine. It's not great, but it's better than some of the self-published Amazon shovelware that I've read. There are a few technical issues here and there, but honestly, I don't even really care about those. Like, it's free. I'm not expecting it to be like perfectly edited or anything. And stylistically, it's not that bad either. There are actually a few lines that I really like, like he'd executed a perfect kill, exploding all of today and all of his tomorrows. And he took a short pause and turned his head towards the sky, as if he was acknowledging the gods of storytelling, commanding them to pay attention. And there are a few fight scenes that are actually paced really well, but let's actually stop and take a few minutes to just talk about these stories. So all told, I found about 22 stories, and they're really not all that bad. They're all fiction stories that act as lessons that the protagonist, who's really just an author insert, learns from his martial arts master Poe and then imparts to the reader. And while there are the occasional spelling mistakes, the actual content of the stories is fine. Like, the stories are actually pretty entertaining. Like, there's one about how the protagonist is curious about a scar that Master Poe has, and he spends the whole story trying to figure out how he got it without actually asking Poe directly, because Poe, as we see in the rest of the stories, is prone to violent outbursts. 
And it's actually really good. Like I was actually invested in learning about this scar. And there's one story about how the protagonist and Master Poe go out to this old burial ground and just punch a bunch of ghosts. And that's like just objectively cool. <laughs> I, don't, I can't think of anything cooler than just punching ghosts. But the most interesting thing is that all of these stories have moral lessons, but most of those lessons don't really seem to fit with what Andrew says in his videos. Like the one about punching ghosts, it ends with Poe showing the protagonist that his words are stronger than any of his martial arts stances. And there's another story about punching trees <laughs> where the protagonist is asked to prove his skill by killing a tree. And he tries to punch it a bunch of times and ends up like breaking all of the bones in his hand. And the master that he's working with is like, you haven't learned anything. And then proceeds to pick off all of the leaves, which will eventually kill the tree. And the moral of this is clearly work smarter, not harder. And sometimes you need to think through your problems instead of just brute forcing them. Another story is about dreams and how Master Poe asks all of the adepts to share their dreams with him but he hates them. Like, Poe hates the whole concept of dreams, and he ends up working the protagonist to the bone until the protagonist is too exhausted to have dreams. And I take this one to mean, like, don't let your dreams be dreams. Like, action and work are more important than just dreaming about something. Other morals are about not being afraid of making mistakes and how failure can sometimes be a good thing and not letting people live rent-free in your brain. And no matter how strong someone is, they will die. It's just up to you how you're remembered before that happens. And these morals are sort of basic, but they're not that bad. The interesting thing is that when you compare them to what Andrew says in his videos and even what he says in the prologue of the stories, they don't really match up, do they? Like his other messages are all about violence and power and taking what you want and being above it all. But these stories aren't about that. They're about understanding that violence isn't always the answer. They're about using your words instead of your fists. They're about patience and meditation and learning from your mistakes. And sure, like, not all of these morals are great or make sense. Like, there's two stories about dragons and pearls and, like, not believing dragon propaganda. Like, I don't know what he was trying to say with that one. <laughs> but the single most interesting thing to me was how much crying happens in these stories. There are half a dozen stories that feature the protagonist and or Master Poe crying, and not in pain. Like, one of the stories they're crying in pain, but the rest are actual emotional vulnerability. And as someone who was called the king of toxic masculinity, you'd think that Andrew would see crying as a weakness. But he doesn't, not in these stories, at least. He seems to have a relatively healthy view of masculinity and emotions. And that's weird, right? This difference between what Andrew says and what he writes. And when I sat and thought about that difference, it actually made me sad. And for a while, I didn't really know why. But after reflecting on it for a few days, I came to the conclusion that it makes me sad because of what these stories reveal about Andrew. They tell us that this guy appreciates nonviolence, that he understands the importance of being in touch with your feelings, that he's okay with men showing vulnerability. They tell us that he doesn't necessarily believe all of the things he talks about. They tell us that somewhere inside him, he has pretty positive views of masculinity and emotions. And, you know, maybe not women, but lots of other things. We'll take what we can get. <laughs> and they tell us that his writing is pretty good. Like, not just in quality, but in content. Like, it's about good things. And I almost wonder if he'd had someone in his life early, maybe a teacher, who told him, hey, Andrew, this story is pretty good. I bet you could grow up to be a successful writer someday. Would he have turned out differently? And when I thought about that, when I considered what could have been if he didn't turn out like this, it broke my heart. Now, don't get me wrong, this guy is a terrible person. He is cruel and manipulative and has allegedly done some genuinely evil things. He is a bad guy. But I also believe that people can change. 
I believe that given the right amount of time and space and ability for introspection, people can change for the better. And I think that if Andrew is found guilty of some of the things he's alleged to have done, and if he ends up spending several years in a space where there's not much he can do but introspect, then it's possible that he could change. I don't know if it'll happen. <laughs> I don't know if he'll be found guilty. I don't know if he'll have a change of heart. I don't even know if he can at this point. But his writing gives me a little bit of hope. This isn't the writing of someone who's evil to his core. And if he's not evil to his core, then he has the capacity for change. There's this saying, when people show you who they are, believe them. And I think that this is true, but I also think that there are different kinds of showing. Andrew's actions show us something. They show us a very bad guy who is the cause of a lot of pain and darkness in the world. But his writing also shows us something. And it shows us something different. And you might be saying, Zoe, this guy is shitty. He's probably just lying and making up faux mystic BS for his fans. But I don't think that's the case. These stories have clear care and effort put into them. So while I think that we should take his actions at face value and judge him accordingly, I also think that we need to pay attention to what his writing is telling us. And it's telling us that Andrew Tate is a complicated dude. He is bad. But that's not all he is. This video was supposed to be fun, silly junk food. It was supposed to be just me coming on here, dunking on an awful dude. Like, this guy is awful. He's terrible. He says terrible things. And it was gonna be fun. We were gonna talk about how shitty he is, crack a few jokes about how bad the writing is, and then wash our hands and move on. But instead, it was actually really hard and not for the reasons that you'd expect. Like, it wasn't hard because of the awful, violent, ignorant shit that Andrew constantly talks about. Like, that sucks, but I can tune it out easily enough. What was hard was that I was genuinely affected by this guy. Like, I've already touched on how his writing hit those English teacher heartstrings, but there was something else, too. As I was scrubbing through his social media to gather all of these stories, I found this post. It's about his dad, Emery Tate II, who was a chess grandmaster and was actually pretty well renowned for it. But in this post, Andrew is talking about how his dad passed away a few years ago and how he wants to live to honor him and his legacy. And he refers to his dad as Master Poe. And that's when it dawned on me. That art for Master Poe Master Poe is Andrew's dad. I don't want to speculate or psychoanalyze or anything, but I don't think that it's outside the realm of possibility that writing these stories was Andrew's way of dealing with the passing of his father. It was his way of dealing with the weight of losing a parent who, if he was anything like Master Poe, was not only an imposing, impressive presence, but also had high expectations for Andrew and really took out his frustration on him if he didn't meet those expectations. Andrew is the oldest of his siblings, and he's named after his dad. His full name is Emery Andrew Tate III. He very explicitly has the weight of his dad's legacy thrust upon him. And that sucks. It's hard. In the post, he even says, I am his earthly representation. I carry his name. And the title of the most brilliant specimen of a man alive has passed from him to me. That's a lot to put on a kid. <sighs> Seeing how he talks about his dad and then looking back at how he writes about Master Poe, it really puts those stories in a new light. There's one story about Master Poe's death, and long story short, like literally it's the longest story by far, he and Poe go on essentially a suicide mission, and they wipe out this whole army. But just as Master Poe kills the opposing commander, the commander stabs him with a poison dart, which then also kills Poe. The protagonist rushes over and desperately makes the herbal tea that can cure the poison. But it's too late. In this field of corpses and destruction, cradling the lifeless body of Master Poe, 
he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, Poe is alive. Barely, but he's alive. And Poe gives the protagonist a characteristically strict punishment for getting blood on his shirt, because that's, like, not allowed in this place. And the two go back to Wudon, good as new. And now, knowing who Poe is, it genuinely, really emotionally affects me. Like, <laughs> this guy wrote this story after his father passed away where the character who stood for his father dies and is somehow miraculously brought back to life. <laughs> How can that not break your heart? <laughs> I, this, it sucks. Like, I, I want to hate this guy. I want to laugh at him and dunk on him and tear apart everything he makes, but I can't. I even debated not making this video at all because I really didn't want you all to think that I was trying to excuse Andrew's behavior because I'm not trying to do that. This guy sucks. But I do think that it's easy to see people like this and forget that they are people. Or at least forget that they're complex, dynamic, complicated people. It would have been so easy to just find these stories and laugh at them for 10 minutes and then move on but I couldn't do that. And I hope that that's not a weakness on my part. I hope that it's not just me being overly sympathetic or too charitable or naive. And I'm so afraid of saying the wrong thing or being misunderstood and it's terrifying. But I hope that you understand what it is that I've tried to do here. I hope that this emotional roller coaster was at least a fun ride because it's supposed to be, you know? Even after writing all of this out and dealing with these conflicting emotions, I still decided to make this video and release it. Because I think that it's worth it. I think that this adventure that we've been on together is valuable. Or at least I hope so. I hope it is. <laughs> but let me know what you think in the comments below, and thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. I know that this one was a little bit different, uh, so let me know if you want me to make more things like this in the future. I'm currently working on the Squeecore video that a lot of you requested, and I'm hoping that it will be out in the next couple weeks. So if you want to be alerted when that comes out, then go ahead and subscribe and ring the bell. And if you want to support me directly, then go ahead and join my Patreon, which I have linked in the description, or hit that join button next to the subscribe button and you can join these wonderful people whose names you see scrolling here. I want to give an especially huge thank you to A Tasty Snack, Adam, Al Swigert, Dylan, Justin Lowry, Robert Bradford, Science Punk Sellout, and Will Swanson. Thank you all so very much. And finally, we have our patron poem of the video. For Emma Silver, this is Ode to a Cobra. Your venom-heavy fangs hang fetid and wet. Quills filled with curses and slurs, dripping words that leave scars or worse. Turns of phrase like poison, the wells never empty. And so you go on, writing and biting, O king of the reptiles. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks.